Hello, new story. How's everybody doing? Good. So glad to be here. For those of you watching online, we love you. Thank you for joining us today as well. How many of you were here last week for the kickoff of our series? Stephen started, and we're in this series called Survival Skills, and he talked about how important it is to live in community. And I believe that that is one of the most important things for us as believers. For those of you that don't know, my name is Nathan, and I'm one of the pastors here at New Story, and it's just an honor to be here. Thank you for Tom for allowing me to come up here and to speak, something I don't do very often, so thank you. (laughs) And uh, I just wanted to ask you guys a quick question. How many of you know what the basic elements of survival are. I know there's a few, but we're just going to talk about the four basic elements of survival. Anybody? Food. That is a good one. Yes, water. Energy. AC. Who said that? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Those are good. Those are good ones. Yes, shelter, water, fire, and Food. So you guys are right on it there. So how many of you like to hike or be in the wilderness at all? I know Stephen was alluding to the fact that a lot of us are from the city or the suburbs, and not a lot of us are used to, we're not like Bear girls. we're not always in the wilderness. And, but, but as we were planning this, this series, we, we started to realize how a lot of these essentials, a lot of these elements really tie into uh, how to survive spiritually, and we, we realize that we really do need a covering with our community and living water, the bread of life, the word of God, and we need the presence of fire to purify, illuminate, and guide us. So I just wanted us to think a little bit about fire today. I don't have an illustration because I didn't want to set something on fire, but uh, here's some water. <laughs> but but uh, as we think about fire, one of the things I love about fire, if you are in the wilderness or for those of you that do camp, you've probably started a fire. Any of you good at starting a fire? Do you usually rely on lighter fluid? (laughs) Yeah, some of you. Okay, that's good. But in the wilderness, a fire not only can purify your water, it can cook your food safely, which is a good thing, and it also creates warmth and comfort physically and emotionally. And in Acts 2, we see it symbolize the very presence of God. On a day when his people were gathered together, God's people were gathered gathered together, the Holy Spirit came upon them and anointed them with his presence. So as we open today, I just wanted to just to pray for just a minute and just ask God's presence uh, to do whatever he chooses today. So Lord God, we just thank you for this time that we are able to come together to gather in this building and for those watching online as well. We pray for the immediate outpouring of the Holy Spirit right now on this place. I pray that as we, we worship right now by listening and engaging, I just pray that we would just begin with two words, with thank you. We want to thank you for who you are and what you've done. I pray that you would just Just give me words to speak. If there's anything that you want me to say or not say, I pray that I'd be attentive to that. We just we just love you. We thank you. We just pray all these things in your name. Amen. 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 So today we're going to be talking about the importance of corporate worship and how important that is. We're going to learn about how worship changes us, how it transforms us. I just want us to think a little bit about this. All of us humans, as you know, even if you're Christian or not, we worship something. This could be a person, a God, a way of life, success, material wealth, prestige, position, or power even. A good question to ask yourself is to just discern what your heart is inclined to worship and to ask yourself, where am I investing my time, my money, and even my mental and my emotional energy? Your bank account, your calendar, those might be some some good things to reflect on. Those are things that you value the most. Sometimes I look at my bank account and I'm like, oh man, am I worshiping coffee? Like what is going on right now? (laughs) But those are things to to really check. For many Christians, worship is what we do on a Sunday morning. We sing songs, we come together. You might listen to a sermon like we're doing right now, share communion, participate in whatever else is scheduled. I know for some people we think, okay, I'm going to get there and then worship will start when 
you know, Eileen gets up here and she starts tickling the keys, the ivories, and she starts playing. Oh, okay, now worship's starting. Worship is music a little bit. That's part of it, but that's uh, it's so much more than that. And so we're going to talk about that today. I also just want to point out that worship is not a genre. Worship is not a genre of music, right? <laughs> So what is it? What is worship? Worship or worship means we're ascribing or giving worth to someone or something. In the Hebrew language, worship means to fall down, prostrate, or to fall or bow down or lay in a posture of humility and adoration. A really important truth that we need to remember is that who or what we worship becomes our God. And we become their slaves. So worshiping God leads to freedom. But worshiping any other gods would lead to slavery. So when we ascribe worth, we bow to something or someone that is greater than us, more worthy than us, so precious and valuable that we want it. We want them or we want them to be lifted higher. When we worship, we're responding to what or who we value the most. So when we worship God, we come into alignment with the truth, the true life, and freedom. For any of you that are taking notes, I know some of you still write on a piece of paper. If you want, you can pull out your phones, use the note app if you'd like. We're going to have a few things to write down. So why do we worship? Why do we worship? We worship because he is holy. He is worthy as well. <laughs> so that is why we worship. Romans 12.1 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. See, when we worship God, we're expressing our love and our gratitude for who he is, for what he's done, what he's said, and what he's promised to do. Even our ability to love and adore and worship God doesn't start with us. See, we have the capacity to love and adore because, as 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because God first loved us. That's right. But we have to have our love in proper order. So, so he is God. He's the only one worthy of our worship, and therefore we bow down before him above all other things. I want to ask you guys a question, if that's okay. Have you ever experienced a time in your life or maybe even some seasons where it's harder or easier to worship? Yeah? Exactly. We just walked through a year and a half of the pandemic. I know a lot of you have lost friends and family. Our world's been in chaos and disarray. War, rumors of war, there's hardship, there's pain. Some of you experienced painful personal tragedies in your own life. And some of you also have enjoyed joyful times of celebration and amazing blessings. But depending on your circumstances, we can feel more or less inclined to worship. In my own life, I've discovered over time because it's not easy, but I've began to just discover with help from, from the Lord as well as a mentor of mine that you can praise him in any situation, in the most amazing season of your life or when things are going really, really tough and you're in deep pain. I don't have to worship only when I feel like it. I don't believe that that's honest worship. We bow down and we exalt God based on who he is, not how we feel. See, his worth remains the same no matter what season we're in. In that place of humility, trust, and surrender, we're recognizing and declaring that he is Lord. If we really understand and start to begin to grasp how much he loves us and how good he is, we couldn't help but worship him. Here's something to think about, and you can write this down. Worship is always a choice. Worship is always a choice. It's not about us. According to the Barna Institute, less than three out of 10, just 29% of church-going adults indicated that they view worship as something that is focused primarily on God. 47% indicated 
that they felt that worship was something undertaken for their personal benefit. But that is not the heart of worship. At the heart of worship, like we just sang just a moment ago, it's all about him. Psalm 29, 2 says, Honor the Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. In 1 Chronicles 16, 25 through 29, it says, Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. The gods of other nations are mere idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and joy fill his dwelling. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in all of his holy splendor. So what exactly is worship? If it's more than just a song, it's our life laid down. I want to give you a few examples, though, of acts of worship that are not just singing, because I know sometimes that's, that's in our head is one of the main things. You know, when we are going throughout our daily life, we could be giving financially. Some of us might express ourselves through art, maybe dance, raising of our hands. We might even bow or be in stillness or like we're doing right now, listening, hopefully. <laughs> we, that's an act of worship, prayer. We can study the scriptures. And these are all things that we're going to talk about and tie in with, with the, the elements over the next few weeks. Other ways that we can worship. And one of the things that I was so impressed about New Story was the food pantry. We can serve others in our community we can be a light in our community. Fellowship, obedience. How many of you were just baptized not too long ago? Yeah? That's a way to express our love and adoration for Jesus. It's so amazing. There's so many ways that we can, we can worship him. I have a friend uh, by the name of Winston, and Winston is now my, I call him my, like my Kenyan father, my mentor, my friend. He's the one on the right side. And I met Winston in Orange County, Costa Mesa area, uh, well over 10 years ago. And my roommates at the time were at a coffee shop and they were praying. And I guess when he first came here, he was told from some people that Americans do not pray in public. They just don't do that. That's not a thing. And so he saw my roommates praying with each other in public and he's like, oh, what is going on? I need to talk to these people. So he starts talking to them. He's really excited. He becomes friends with them, which in turn, they introduced me to him. And now to this day, we've, we've stayed very, very close. He calls me his son. And so he's now on the East Coast. And actually, right now, he's in Kenya. He's spending a few months there. And, and when we would get together, or we'd start talking. He said, I talked to my family on the phone. I told them I've been hanging out with my son again. And then he would show them a picture of me, and they'd be like, wait, what? What do you mean your son? <laughs> and he's like, he's like, he's a Kenyan. He's easygoing. He's flexible. He's, he's all in no matter what. And so, so we have such a good time. And we might look different, but we have Jesus in common. And I just love that about how our local church is family. The way that we worship together just fuels our witness in our community. When I first started dating my now wife, Christina, one of the things that really impressed me at first was her intentionality. How many of you have heard of the, the five love languages? Yeah? So mine is words of affirmation. So of course, like when I first started meeting her, I'm like, I'm gonna lead with this. Like, you're amazing, Did it? you know? And not that words don't mean things to her, but she's acts of service. And so she cared a lot more about you better show me that you love me. Don't just tell me. <laughs> so when I first started dating her, I'm, I'm asking her all these questions. And when I really was like, you know what, I am, I am definitely wanting to pursue her, I asked her, can I be your, your boyfriend? And she was like, what does that mean to you? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. She ain't playing right now. Like... <laughs> She's, 
She's intentional. She's got some questions for me. <laughs> and so I just loved that about her. And then I started to see the more that I dated her, the way that she just loved people, the way that she loved God, the way that she just poured out her heart towards people, just sat with people in their darkness and actually just really looked at people in the eye, spent time with them and showed them that she loved and cared for them. And I see that with, with us as, as people that want to be more like Jesus. We don't accidentally become more like Jesus. Like, oh, hey, one day I'm just I'm going to be like Jesus. It comes with intentionality. So just lip service is not what he wants. So when we come in here, we just he doesn't want just memorized worship. He wants worship from the heart. Isaiah 29, 13 says, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. God loves wholehearted worship. And in 2 Chronicles 31, 21, you get a picture of Hezekiah and how he worked. And God says that he worked with his whole heart. So we know a little bit about worship, but when and where should we worship? I believe that it is always and everywhere. You may know this story in John 4, 19, it, a little bit of a background before we read it. Jesus is with his disciples, and he's on his way to Galilee from Judea. In order to get there, he had to pass through a central area called Samaria. So while he's passing through, Jesus stops to rest a little bit, and he tells his disciples, hey, go grab some food. And so while he's sitting there, a Samaritan woman walks up, approaches him, and they begin to have a conversation at one point, a conversation of worship, a topic of worship comes up. And so it says this in John 4, 19 through 24. The woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me this. Why do our fathers worship God here on this nearby mountain? But your people teach that Jerusalem is the place where we must worship. Which is right, Jesus responded. Believe me, dear woman, the time has come when you won't worship the Father on a mountain, nor in Jerusalem, but in your heart. Your people don't really know the one they worship. We Jews worship out of your, our experience, for it's from the Jews that salvation is made available. From here on, worshiping the Father will not be a matter of the right place, but with the right heart. For God is a spirit, and he longs to have sincere worshipers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and in the truth. I love this passage because Jesus is breaking all these human religious expectations and standards of how we worship, the right way or in the correct location. He's basically saying that we can worship him and be close to him anywhere we are physically and at any time as long as our worship is sincere and it's from the heart. How freeing is that? I feel like the Lord... It's, it's so great when he just looks at our hearts. So we could be going to the grocery store. We can be taking our kids to school. We could be, whatever it is, we can be worshiping. We can seek his presence wherever we're at and whatever we're doing when we're serving others as well. So we see that God has extended grace and freedom for us to not be constrained to a building or a method or a time frame. Like you have to worship at this time, at this place specifically, it, it gives us a little room there. But that does leave us with a question. Does it make any difference if we worship alone or together or in a corporate setting? I believe that, like I said, you can worship anywhere with God by yourself. However, today I really just want to hone in on worshiping in a corporate setting and why that might be different and so important as well. You might even be thinking, well, hey, you're the online pastor. Like, can't we just watch it online together? Like, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be good? <laughs> so I just want to address that a little bit. I think in this day and age, we need both in-person and a digital connection. But I do believe that nothing's going to ever completely replace someone being close to you face-to-face -face and in person. How many of you... Do online dating? No, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Even if you do, that's okay. But if you're doing online dating, you know that you, 
typically will download an app and you start filling out your profile, you get some information in there, you might even ask a friend, like, hey, like, what am I good at? Oh, I'm adventurous, I'm this and that. You know, <laughs> you might like add some things, get your friend to take a picture of you, you put it online, and then you start going through, checking out, okay, who do I wanna possibly get to know? So you get to know somebody, and you're on this app, and can you imagine if weeks and months go by, and you're like, okay, can't wait to meet you on that app again. Like, like, let's just, let's hang out uh, tomorrow night on that app. That would be great. You know, and I know from connecting with people who actually are not in the same place that that is so important. Obviously, we can, but I think most people would probably eventually want to be like, are you going to take me, like, on a date? Like, do you want to take me to dinner? Do you want to <laughs> see me face to face? I want to see if you're a real person because my heart's in this, and I'm actually connecting with you on a real level, but... There's something about seeing that person for the first time face to face. Another thing that I think about is when we book a plane ticket, right? A lot of us start with our computers or we pull out our phones, we find the right seat, we check out where we want to sit, we get to the airport, we still pull out our phones even though we're physically somewhere, and we get to the gate, and then we sit next to a physical person. I know some of us, we don't talk to anybody because we just want to take a nap or we're just kind of in the zone, maybe we're working. One of my old pastors, Becky, she, uh, <laughs> she, uh, she would make a ministry out of like getting on an airplane. She goes to D.C. and prays with people, and she would go sit on an airplane, and we couldn't wait till she would get back, because she was like, if you're sitting, we'd always say to people, if you sit next to Becky, you're about to get saved, because she, she just talked to you, and she's just, she shares her testimony. She has a super powerful testimony, and she would just start sharing her testimony, and people would just start getting saved, things would start changing in their life. And so, so it's just fun to, to see that. But I think of that story because I think of how we, we start digital sometimes and we need to use those tools, but then it's so important for us to, to connect in those ways physically. One last example, I used technology to ask my father-in-law in Germany for his daughter's hand in marriage. We, we were together in spirit, but I had to FaceTime them. I knew things were moving along, and it was time to ask my then-girlfriend, and uh, I just I really wanted to ask his permission, so I FaceTimed him. And then this past July, for two weeks, I was able to go visit him in Germany. And there's nothing like spending time with family face-to-face -face and actually having a, a conversation with them. So if you're at home and you're watching I'm so thankful that you are joining us, and I know that there are also some of you who are just not able to meet, maybe even this weekend specifically. You're on vacation, you're on the road, and you're watching this when you have time to watch it, or maybe you're going to watch later on. That is amazing. That's better than nothing, and you are absolutely family, and we're so glad that you're joining us. But if we are, let's engage if we're watching at home. I encourage you not to multitask I know if you're like me or you get a little distracted, you might hit play on YouTube, go make some coffee or do some laundry or do something else. Or uh, some of you might have kids at home and they're running around and you're just like, this is not a great worship environment. And so just like if we were to come here, we get prepared, we get dressed, we get ready. If there's some things that we can do when we're at home to, to get ready to, to actually engage in worship, I would encourage you to do that because I believe that worship just watching worship is not worship. If we're just kind of like, oh yeah, okay, great. That's a cool song. Or, oh yeah. Like, that's not worshiping. So I would encourage, even if we're in here, let's, let's try to engage if we can. So why do we gather to worship then? If we can just watch online, like why should we gather? I want to give you three examples. Encouragement, transformation, and testimony. The first one to encourage one another. It says Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Worshiping Jesus together, I believe, is one of the most important things that we do throughout the week. If, if a lot of our messages were how they are right now, I'm kind of just talking to you, right? Hopefully you're listening a little bit. 
But if most of our messages are like that, you could probably just sit at home and listen and hopefully take some notes, and that could be engaging. But when we come together and we actually embrace who God is, we say, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in my life. Thank you for who you are. I want to worship you. Things begin to shift. That is something that we do together that we can't do on our own. It's, it's just different. And yes, we do want to worship on our own. That is so important. However, when we come together, there's nothing like it. We're all one body. We're the body of Christ. Amen? Are we awake? Yes. <laughs> so I have a good friend. His name's AJ. And one of the things about encouragement that I love is he, he was uh, one of the youth pastors at the church I was at previously. And I was leading worship, and as I'm singing a song, I would, just, I would just look out at this guy, and I know his testimony. I know what he's gone through in his life, and every single time, no matter what it looked like, whether he was bowing on the floor, whether he was raising his hands, whatever it was, and I'm not saying that you have to do these things. I know sometimes I've learned over, over time that a lot of us are worshiping in our hearts and we're not responding physically in a certain way. But this guy, I could just tell, no matter what he was doing, he was always just so engaged with, with worship. He, would, he wouldn't let any moment pass. It didn't matter who was leading. It did not matter. He would just be so engaged. And I feel like when I would be up there, I would, it would really allow me to just step into something beyond uh, what I would have been doing on my own. It was just, it's just so helpful to see. Somebody might have a word and they might speak it out in this atmosphere. Somebody might sing something next to you. They might sing over you. And that's just such a powerful thing that we can't always get on our own. We've all experienced things differently growing up, but we can teach each other and build each other up. One of the, one of the things that I've enjoyed that I've, I've done a couple years back is I went with Winston to, to Kenya, and while I was there, I ran the Nairobi Marathon. And as I was training, as I was getting ready, um, this is not a picture of it, by the way, but this is just an example. Uh, they use a term in Kenya called harambe, and what that means is we all pull together. We're in this together. And if you ask any Kenyan marathoner, which I did, I was like, well, how, why are you so good? <laughs> you know, what is going on? You're amazing at marathon running. And a lot of it comes down to we work together, we train together, we are in and we live in community. And it's not just running. That's a, something that is a part of Kenyan culture. And I just love that. I know a lot of you meet once a week or every other week. And why do you do that? You meet together because you realize that you're better together, and that's why we have small groups. Number two, to tr be transformed together. Corporate worship also plays a crucial part in our sanctification, which is being set apart or made holy as we worship, allowing our hearts to be changed and transformed, and we become more and more conformed into the image of Jesus. So again, we're being very intentional Corporate worship is for upbuilding and encouraging and consolation. It says this in Psalm 34, 1 through 3. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. When our hearts feel it the least, is when we need to remind our souls it's good to be near God. He can change us on the spot. Amen? Amen. Psalms 73, 25 through 2. Do you guys like scripture? Is that good? Is that okay? <laughs> All right. Psalms 73, 25 through 2 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So when we join in corporate worship, God loves not only to change our minds, but to change our hearts. And lastly, number three is to be a living testimony. In Colossians 3, it says this, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in our hearts. For as members of one body, you're called to live in peace and always be thankful. 
Again, we approach worship with thank you. I want to be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness Fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So in this passage, we're reminded that the ways that we speak, live, and worship are a testimony to Christ within us. See, we are his representatives. The worship that fills our hearts, changes our lives, and it makes an impact on how we represent Jesus to the world and others around us. Another really profound image of this opportunity to be a living testimony that we see is when Paul and Silas were unjustly imprisoned. Rather than cowering and complaining, Acts 16.25 tells us that About midnight, Paul and Silas, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Can you imagine that, the power of their testimony? Here you are, you're in prison, and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, there's these two guys next to you in the cell beside you, and they start singing, and they're worshiping, and they're praising God, the last thing that you would expect to probably hear. You know, I don't know what the story is of every prisoner in that jail, but we do know that the jailer and his whole household became followers of Jesus because of the testimony of Paul and Silas. It's an incredible story. I love that. So I want to close with a few thoughts. Corporate worship demands that we discipline ourselves to respond and not only pursue God on our own terms. It's an opportunity to embrace being led and not always taking the lead. So how exactly do we worship? We worship when we respond. It begins with him. It's not about us. God is present with his people, desiring to connect, to be known by us. And he sees and he knows what is truly inside of us. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, we must lay before him What is in us, not what ought to be in us. Sometimes we feel like we need to get things together or wait or, okay. We must lay before him what is actually in us, not what ought to be in us. In this past week in one of our staff meetings, uh, Tom was sharing with us about 42% of the Psalms are laments. Lamenting is defined as to feel loss, sorrow, or regret often expressed in a physical way. The Bible gives voice to the sorrow, struggle, and heartache that we often face. And do you know what that means? That means that your voice, your voice of lament can be worshiped too when it's offered up to God in honesty and humility. So many of us live under this burden of what we think that we ought to be, but God calls us to admit who we are where we're at, and worship him truly out of that. We want to be authentic. It's okay to not be okay. It's to say, hey, Lord, here I am right now. Amen. I heard a pastor say once, I don't want anyone leading us in worship that doesn't worship when they're not leading. (laughs) I'm going to say that again. I don't want anyone leading us in worship that doesn't worship when they're not leading. So our first calling is to worship wherever we are, whether or not anyone is watching. We're not up here for you to watch. (laughs) We're not here uh, to, to sing a certain way or play a certain way. We're here to worship the King of Kings. We can also strive to have hearts that are made and kept ready to worship. Sometimes we gotta ask. These are qualities that we can ask God to increase in our lives. There's times where I'd have to say, Holy Spirit, increase Humility, increase tenderness, surrender, availability, faith. Maybe, Lord, I need some more hope or I need some trust. We can ask him for that. But let's think about this for a moment again. If worship is our response to God, then why is that so important? Can you picture maybe your parent or your partner or your spouse or your fiancé over there? (laughs) Um, 
they were to walk up to you with great affection and say, I love you. And you're just kind of like, yeah, okay, cool. Um, or, yeah, 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 you too. I, I got something going on. Or like, you know, sometimes what we do in worship, like, yeah, like, the song's all right, but I got Drake on repeat, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, it's like God is coming and saying, I love you in countless ways throughout our days and our lives. And when we leave his declaration of love without a response, I just feel like we're missing it. So here's my encouragement. Let us find ways to respond in love and worship to God today. In just a few moments, we're gonna take time to sing again. And so why exactly do we sing? If you're saying, hey, Nathan, we... You just said, like, worship's, or singing's part of it. That is true. We, we can worship in so many ways, like Romans 12, 1 talked about, with our lives laid down. But we sing because the word tells us to do so. There's some commands even to do so. And there's more than 400 verses that reference singing and almost 50 direct exhortations to sing. But there's also freedom for us to express our response in other ways, we might lift our hands, we might bow down, or we may kneel possibly. For some of us, we might even shout. We have something that we would just want to speak out, or we might want to clap. Some people like to move, they like to dance, or maybe if we need to lament, we might worship with tears of sorrow, yet a heart that is set steadfastly in faith upon the Lord's goodness. As I mentioned earlier, I know that each one of you finds yourself in a unique season and place today. So as we close, I want to give you some different examples of ways that we can worship that you might want to practice this week. Maybe God is inviting you to engage in worship in a new or less familiar way, but as an invitation to strengthen or encourage you. So we're going to put a few examples here on the screen Worship can be these things, maybe this week for you in different ways. Worship as adoration, because he is worthy, letting your soul exalt the Lord. Worship as celebration, rejoicing in who he is and what he's done. Worship as healing, letting his words and love sink deep into our hearts. Worship as declaration, Truth for us to remember, for others to hear. Worship as protection, singing over each other and over ourselves. Worship as formation, setting our spirits right for today and for eternity. Worship as communion with God and with each other. And worship as warfare, Declaring God's truth and victory over every battle in darkness. So you will experience God by responding, and God will experience us through worship. So we're going to take a little bit of time right now. We're going to receive our tithes and offering, and we're also going to have an extended time of worship. As we do, you can pull out your phones and scan the QR code. You can also click the link in the chat if you're watching online. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says this, On every Lord's day, each of you should put aside something from what you have earned during the week and use it for this offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. So whether we have a little bit or we have a lot, we want to respond today with our whole hearts, with our whole selves. And I want to pray real quick, actually, before we, before we do this. But I'm going to pray, and the team's going to lead us in worship as we respond. So, Lord, we just thank you so, so much that we can just come together, that we can gather together. For those of us that are at home right now or we're driving in our cars and we're listening to the best of our ability, I pray that we would engage with what 
you're speaking to us, that we would listen to you, that we would approach the throne with thank you. We want to thank you for how good you are, for how faithful you are, for how your track record is perfect, that you never fail us, Jesus. So no matter where we're at today, however we came into this room or wherever we're at sitting on our couch or wherever we are, I pray that we would approach you authentically and we would worship you with our whole hearts. God, we love you. We praise you. We want to give you our hearts right now in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's worship together.